Welcome once again to the Brattlecast. Jordan Rich here with my very good friend and confidant Ken Gloss, the proprietor of the fabulous and famous Brattle Bookshop on West Street in Boston. You've seen him on Antiques Roadshow. You've heard him on these podcasts. And if you haven't visited the store, you don't know what you're missing. So, Ken, nice to see you here. You didn't have to take a plane to get here either. No, I didn't have to take a plane to get here, uh, although... I, you know, one of the things I love about plane traveling and flying mm-hmm. is I get I get an aisle seat so that I don't have to climb over anybody when I have to go to the bathroom. But I open a book. I get on the plane. I put my luggage up above. I open a book, and I can read without anybody bothering me. It's uh, it's it's like that episode of The Twilight Zone with Burgess Meredith in the bank. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. But yeah, <laughs> it's the perfect reader's paradise, and, and you lose yourself in a book. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and you don't worry about landing and takeoff. And, uh, but it's, it's a great spot to read a book. Now, why did I even go there? Because that's the subject matter, in a sense, of today's podcast, of today's Brattlecast. It has to do with books about space and air travel and so forth, and you have one in particular. I I got one in particular, Travels in Space, and this book is printed in 1902. Whoa. So that's even before the Wright brothers, well, they were just beginning to get going, and a history of aerial navigation. Now, a lot of people, they think of space travel or air, air travel as starting essentially with the Wright brothers in 1910. You can go back to almost the 1700s and people were going up in balloons and uh, managing that. But they were also, around the late 1800s, a lot of people were trying to get gliders uh, and figure out how to do air travel. And there were actually, it wasn't just the Wright brothers. There were a number of different groups or people trying to figure out... In other countries, too, in France and elsewhere. So this book sort of leads into that a little. Uh, They have pictures of balloons going up. But uh, balloons were a big deal then. Mm. Uh, But here's a man with... uh, It almost looks like something Leonardo da Vinci would do, but you have pedals, and you almost... You, it's person power by pedaling, uh, and it would bring his his a blimp that literally there's a little bike at the bottom. I think most of us have seen the the silent films of all the failures before the Wright brothers. You know all those crazy contraptions. So this book really in 1902 is cataloging a lot of it. I'm cataloging a lot of it, and probably you know there's a little bit of everybody. Even now you watch Star Trek. You watch uh, Star Wars, and it's still the unknown, the the going out. And this sort of brings that, I'm sure, uh, to people. Uh, And this did it from a, quote, factual basis, although some of it worked and some of it didn't work. Right. Well, at the same time, around the same time, you had two prolific science fiction writers, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, and they were rocketing in their stories, People to the Moon and War of the Worlds and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there was the beginnings of it. And, of course, even when you see in the earlier times the cannons shooting out uh, cannonballs, well, they went a long way. Or the in the uh, ships, you know, with cannons and being able to bombard towns and cities, you know, that's one step away from putting something else in that will go further and further. So that's one of the great things. And we get collections like that in. And some of the books, especially when you get back into the early uh, aviation, can be quite valuable. We one time, this was an interesting uh, item. Uh, There was a man who was interested mainly in the history of the West. But they had a college in the Midwest got his books and said, We've taken out what we want, but we can't use it all. Somehow they got in touch with me. They sent a few pictures. We said, well, yeah, that looks good. And we bought a bunch of the books. And then they said, there's 6,000 books in Medford, Oregon. And I said, well, it's sort of hard to look and see. And they sent, again, a few sample pictures. And I said, okay, I'll buy these for $50,000, sight unseen, Whoa. just from the pictures. Yeah. And then it was another $10,000 to get them shipped from 
the West Coast, and and I'm all the time saying, I think this is good. I think it's going to be right. I think it will work. Uh, they were thrilled because they actually were paying a lot of money in storage, mm. and they 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 wanted to get a fair price. They had gotten a few bids, and when we got them in. We started unpacking the boxes and unpacking, and a lot of them were about the cattle industry, about San Francisco, about the West Coast, uh, almost anything you can think about the West. And then there were two little boxes. They were boxes that were specially made to hold small books and pamphlets. And I opened them up, and one of them is a book by the Wright brothers in 1903 on the theory of flight. And then the other one was in 1904. These were the some of the very, very first publications, printed things that the Wright brothers ever put out. They, they're little pamphlets. I mean, if you didn't know what they were, you'd just toss them away. When At the time, they were just meant to be read, disposed of, and all of this. Incredibly rare. So... We have 6,000 books on a trailer truck full of books, Mm -hmm. and you have these two little pamphlets that paid for the deal. (laughs) And which made the rest of it real easy because if I was going through everything else and saying, okay, this is worth $10, this is worth $20, oh, wait a minute, we've got one here worth $100. It takes a long time to get up to $50,000, $60,000, but once you've sold enough, and this is with many collections that we buy, once I've reached the point and I go, well, we're even on this, which means everything else is profit, it actually, a lot of times then, if someone comes up and they're buying a lot, I say to them, look, or they say to me, look, we're buying a lot, can you do a little better? And I'm figuring, yeah, it's all profit, uh, if, especially if they ask nicely and are friendly and... Uh, since so, the topic is space, yes, I'm going to just take a little side venture here. You have to know when you're ordering in from Oregon 6,000, maybe 10,000 books that there's room in the building for all these books, right? Well, what we do sometimes on lots like that, and, and I'm very careful about it, we will actually get a temporary storage ah, area, okay. and, but we budget that in because when you get a storage area like that, they can cost three, four, five hundred dollars, six hundred a month. Mm. Well, you know, five, six months. That adds it, up. It adds up fast. We and this is getting off shelf. I'm going to get back to space oh, no, in a no, little no. while. I, I, I think but this is interesting. We one time went. There was a big storage area in right across the street from MIT called Metropolitan Storage. It had been in business for probably 150 years, but MIT bought the building. Uh, recently in the storage area was moving out and they were going to convert the building. We got called into one storage area, and I'm sure this was not, you know, an anomaly. I'm sure there were loads mm-hmm. of them. The people had had that storage area, and it was a big one, for about 40 years and had been paying each month. Probably had paid well over $100,000, dollars in storage fees. The stuff in there was junk, literally. But the family put the stuff in there. Probably nobody ever really bothered. They just automatically were paying the bills, paying the bills. And that made a huge impression on me that most stuff that you stick in these storage areas, you could throw it all away and buy it new for less (laughs) than you can do it. So I tell people to be really careful because the storage areas work well when you're moving, when you get a large lot like we do, when there are things in there that are sentimental, but be really careful. And uh, I guess the storage area people— That's why they call them storage wars. And they actually uh, do really well, but they serve a very good purpose. Uh, But, you know, when you're talking, though, about space and flight, all through the history of it, whether you're going from these early ones to maybe World War I— where you start to have military aviation to World War II when you get to the jets, to getting actually up. We recently got a collection of books, uh, about six or seven books, all signed by the astronauts, each one by a different astronaut. And, you know, when I tell people, they sometimes ask me, what are areas 
that you think would be great to collect that we haven't, you know, that aren't gaining as much interest? A lot of people asked me this 20 years ago. Now it's catching up with my prediction. But space travel and space is just an area that even though it's gone up tremendously in value, in value I think it's going to continue to go up yeah. because – it's the new frontier. Well, when when you have Captain Kirk himself in space at 90 years old and you got the private enterprise doing it. You know what's interesting about this book, uh, just one of many, Travels in Space? Uh, the fact of the matter is at that point in time, there was probably no better history of all the machines prior to the Wright brothers. So it's it's a living history. You probably couldn't or wouldn't bother to do that kind of history today. So it exists as it is. Well, I think people probably would – go back and do it but this is in the time so it's it's also when you read a history from this period about the period mm. it's sometimes different than when you're looking back well, it at feels it like, years it feels ago. like current events it feels like exactly. exciting new developments and that that it's just focus well, of where well, it's coming from that's what a lot of collecting books on any type of travel and exploration and this just happens to be the air off off earth out of space. And there's always the fascination with the unknown and getting out there. So books on airplanes, space travel, it's there's always that excitement, being a pilot, being an astronaut. Sure. So many people want to be that. And if they can't quite do it themselves, they want to get the books and collect the items about that. And that's why it's a great area of collecting. And it's called uh, Travels in Space – and yet there were no such things as, quote, astronauts thought of necessarily, except in science fiction. But uh, wasn't Robert Goddard, a Massachusetts gentleman who developed a rocket? That was later. That was, that, that was, that was later. That was getting in between the wars. Yeah, in the and 20s. He was, he was out of Worcester Polytech. Right, is right. Where he, and he was shooting uh, rockets up and trying to see if they could get into space. But at this time, space— could be just as high as a bird would fly. Right. And the pilot was like the astronaut. The pilot of the balloon. Uh, exactly. And then as they started to progress, you could have passengers go, just like now they you can pay to go up. Uh, in, in I fact, can't afford it, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends if you find more Wright Brothers collections. <laughs> I think they call them aeronauts, if they, I'm not mistaken. Absolutely call them aeronauts. Mm. And then you also had the early races. You can sometimes get posters and books that they had aviation races that you could go around, you know, for miles. And they actually raced in – Here's an interesting personal story. Uh, we were recently went to a baseball game with a colleague of mine who's in the Antiques Roadshow, loves baseball from this area, and her mother came along. Mm -hmm. And her mother is 85 years old and a wonderful, wonderful person. I mean, just great. We were having fun at the ball game early in the season when they still weren't allowing 100 percent capacity. And I was talking, uh, my wife Joyce was talking with the uh, colleague, and I was talking with her mother. And her mother going, you know, I'm 85. It's about time to give up the license in the plane, too. She wasn't talking about her auto license. Oh. She was talking about her pilot's license. But it even gets better than that. And this is where you pick up a book and start off in one subject, and then you go off in the other. But it even gets better than that. She was a pilot for, and this is a great story, for 60 years. And I asked, well, why did you first get a pilot's license? And she says, well, we had a house on Cape Cod, and we drove down one day, and the traffic was horrible. She said, the first thing I did was went to an airport and said, can you teach me how to fly? And then she got a pilot's license and could fly to Cape Cod, cut out the traffic. Then it even goes beyond this. And, and this is one of the great things about what I do with books and so on and the people and how you start off in one story mm. and you're off in another. She belongs to a club called the 99 Club, which Amelia Earhart started. And this has been a club that's been going – of women pilots. And there were loads of them. I mean, World War II, there were women pilots. But they used to have races. The 99 Club, they would start – in Canada and maybe fly to Florida 
And they did this every year, and they would have stops along the way, and they'd have a pilot and a navigator. And so, you know, it, it was – she said it was as much a contest as it was a social event because you'd stop and talk. And my father – my son-in-law, I was one time talking to him about this, and he was in air traffic control. And I said, well, you know, I met this woman, and she's in the – he says, I used to talk to the 99 Club all the time. No when, kidding. In, 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 so it's a very good chance that – my son-in-law's father could have at one time been on the radio talking with my friend's mother. That's so amazing. It pulls it all together. Yeah. But when you get things like this, that's partly why people collect, why they like collecting. It's not only an area that they have passion about, but they meet people who have the passion about it. They meet friends. Then there's always, in a way, the hunt, the flying out to – Yard sales, library sales, auctions, now going online and looking for travels in space by Sir Hiram Maxim. You don't know who's listening to the podcast might go, I've been looking for that book for a long time. So it's that joy and that interest in the subjects and what you study and what each little nook and cranny of knowledge and, and who's interested? And that's one of the things that people like, one of the things we have. And I could probably walk through my store and just pull out almost any book, and there's a story. As we've heard, uh, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of books, which means we've got about a thousand maybe times 10 podcasts to get through before we even scratch the surface. You can't even scratch the surface. <laughs> but what I will say to people listening is you can sometimes – when I do a talk, people ask me questions. And I said, I can answer any question and probably go off on a tangent on anything because that's what books are. So if anyone's listening and they have a book like this or some subject and topic that they want to talk about, send me an email, get in touch, come into the store. And we've had a few of them where people have called in, emailed in. Uh, texted in. There are about a million ways to get in touch now uh, or actually come into the store and get, made some suggestions. And some of the subjects on these podcasts are because people either mentioned it or said, could you do? Well, the best way to connect digitally, just go to brattlebookshop.com, brattlebookshop.com. It's time to put our seat trays and forward and uh, no seats back and trays forward yeah, so i can and, never be a flight attendant and make sure your seat belts well, uh, well make sure your too. yeah your seat belt is fastened <laughs> uh stories about books old rare and out of print the people who buy sell appraise and collect them it's always fun ken thank you as always thank you i appreciate it